Good morning, everyone, and welcome to today's focus for Saturday, December the 31st, 2022 at 11.23 a.m. Central Time. Well, this is the last Today's Focus podcast episode for 2022. The last Today's Focus podcast episode of 2022. We started this series in 2022. I can't say that it has gone exactly the way I envisioned it, exactly the way I thought it would go, but I am, I am committed to continuing to try to do this. Again, the goal of the Today's Focus podcast series really has been to try to give everyone one, th- because I, I feel that there are a million distractions in the life of every believer. So the goal is to try to say, hey, here's something to focus on for your day. Here's one thing to focus on. Um, amidst all of those distractions, here's one thing to focus on. And I try to give that to you in around 15 to 20 minutes. That was kind of the the idea, kind of the vision. I still don't know if I have completely done that correctly. And obviously, time and time again, I've gone past the 15 minute mark. I've gone 20 minutes. And then yesterday we went an hour. (laughs) So, so that, that definitely did not, that kind of violated the spirit of what this podcast series is supposed to be about, but we will see what will happen in 2023, whether the today's focus podcast series continues or whether it ends, obviously the Theology Central podcast, where all of these other podcast series are a part of, that's going to continue. And I'll continue to try to figure out the best way to bring you content that I think will be challenging, interesting, at times thought-provoking, and yes, at time rage-inducing, because I do have a tendency to go against what most Christians think. So you have to be kind of prepared for that. But I think that there needs to be a podcast within the Christian world that sometimes challenges the the way Christians think. I think there needs, I think there's room for that. And so, I mean, there has to be room for that because most don't. Most kind of pick their team. Like they look at Christianity and say, my team is the reformed world or my team is the, and then you pick your team and you build your audience and then that's you. And I don't want a team. I don't want a team. I just, uh, here's my team. I want people who are like, you know what? I want to be challenged. I want to think, and I want to pursue truth at all costs. So I try a lot of different podcast series to try to accomplish some of those goals. This is just one of them. And hopefully we can make it work. But if I, if I don't stop, I'm going to go over my time limit again today. Today for today's focus, our focus is Made up Bible verses, made up Bible verses. Remember, I received an email a couple of days ago entitled with the subject line, eight key Bible verses were just made up. Eight key Bible verses were just made up. And this email using an article that obviously can be found on the internet basically makes the claim that if you look at Christianity, Christianity is really founded. Christianity is really made up of basically uh, eight key Bible verses. I don't know how they came to that conclusion because anyone who, I, I mean, I think biblical Christianity is based off all 66 books of the Bible, but what do I know? <laughs> they think it's made up of eight verses and and the eight verses they look at, I don't think that's what makes up Christianity, but I, but I digress. So, I mean, uh, really the premise is already kind of flawed in my estimation, but you know what? Whenever I receive something that's critical either of my teaching or of a doctrinal position I have or of Christianity in general, I always want to give it a fair hearing. And here's the reason why, because I know I'm not infallible. So I like to be challenged. I like to see. Do, do, do I always like the fact that maybe I have to admit that I was wrong? No, but as much as I don't like that, on the other hand, I love that because that gets me one step closer to truth. So sometimes it's a love-hate relationship. I think you can all understand because sometimes when you believe certain things, you hold that truth dearly. And then when you have to go, well, Maybe I was wrong. And that explains a little bit of why yesterday went an hour long, 
because it dealt with a subject that I really thought I understood and there was a challenge to it, so I wanted to be fair to it. But here's what we've covered so far. According to them, again, uh, they, this is what they, and I'll, I'll just read the beginning of this uh, article or this email. When I grew up in church, what people call Christianity mostly boiled down to a couple of Bible verses, which again, is just, I don't, that is just so, that may have been your experience, and I don't know what was going on in, in the church you attended, but that's not biblical Christianity. They go on to say, I've learned later that they were all faked, that all of these Bible verses were just completely faked, and that Christians for all of these years have never figured it out. So you're already kind of, I'm like, whatever. All right, but here's what they've given us so far. Quick review. Are you ready? Number one, does Genesis say the world is evil? And so they claim that Christians made up a Bible verse in Genesis that says the world is evil, but they, that's not what they, they, their whole, they misunderstand Christians saying the world is cursed as saying the world is evil and it's, it's all kinds of problems. Then number two is everyone desperately wicked. They claim Jeremiah 17, 9 is completely made up and that what, that it's does, it should not read the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. According to them, it should read the heart is more closely kept than anything and humanity, what human being can know it. Now they argue basically for a variation of the translation found in the Septuagint versus what is found in the Hebrew text. Now, I think it, they do, even though they're not really intending to do this, they do raise an, an interesting point, right? They, they don't really explicitly say this, but they kind of lead us into this interesting point. It is something for all of us to consider why the Septuagint is so radically different than the Hebrew text when it comes to Jeremiah 17, 9. But I will say this, whatever we do with Jeremiah 17, 9, whether you want to keep it or whether you want to throw it out, okay, whatever you want to do with it, I can still pr- prove human depravity from Genesis to Revelation without Jeremiah 17.9. So by throwing out Jeremiah 17.9, you did not throw out the doctrine of total depravity. All right. So number three, is lust forbidden? They go after Matthew 5.28 and they make an argument that, that we've misread Matthew 5.28 and that Jesus is not... Uh, That Jesus is not referring to inner erotic interest as bad. Now, you go look at Matthew 5, 28. I don't even know how you come to this conclusion, but okay. All right, and so we've looked at that. Number four, does Paul call sexual interest burning? They quote 1 Corinthians 7, 9, but if they cannot contain, let them marry, for it is better to marry than to burn. They say the burning there is grief. So their argument that what Paul is literally saying is, hey, if you're grieved because you're single, get married. It's better to get married than for you to grieve about being single. The only problem is, if you look at 1 Corinthians 7 from verse 1 down, it's about sex. <laughs> it's about the sexual relationship. So I don't know how they could have, they would, just based off the context of the chapter, you would have to go with, uh, a di- I mean, the chapter is not about grieving, The chapter is about sexual relations. So, all right. Then number five, does God tell you to spank your children? They quote uh, Proverbs 13, 24, whoever spares the rod hates their children, but the one who loves their children is careful to discipline them. According to them, the rod does not mean um, an instrument to spank or to punish with physically, but the rod just represents authority. Rod, the rod represents guidance. The rod represents, uh, can represent healing and caring. And so that this is not a mandate to spank. We covered all of that yesterday in great detail. But today we come to number six. And number six is, according to this article and according to the email I received, here we go. Does purity mean virginity? Does purity mean virginity, if I can speak correctly? Does purity mean virginity? Now, I, I think I know where they're going with this, but let's listen. Are you ready? Let's pay close attention. Here is the claim. The word purity is found throughout the Bible. In the Old Testament, it referred to a set of laws that guarded the sacred space around the temple. 
The impurity came from other deities and from death, dead bodies. And then they they name a number of bodily fluids here that could also be create impurity were sources of purity violation. So they're referring to some of the Levitical laws about, say, a woman on her menstrual cycle, other things that would create some form of impurity or kind of a ceremonial uncleanliness, maybe the best way to, to describe it. But they're saying those were the rules and re- regarding purity. What never tripped a purity violation, now according to them, this is what never created a purity violation, was sex outside of marriage. And yet that's what Christians say purity means. Christian sex manuals like to quote the single time in the New Testament when purity appears sexual in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verses 1 through 8. And then we read this. They, they have this in quote. For God has not called us for impurity, but in holiness. They don't quote purity references like 1 John 3, 3, where the quality intensifies the more one reflects on Jesus. All who have this hope in him purify themselves just as he is pure. What purity means in the New Testament is sort of unclear. The Christian effort to pass it off as a measurement of sexual experience in relation to to a marital state was a total religious fraud. So according to them, Christians made up this idea that purity has anything to do with sexual sexual practice or sex outside of marriage. In other words, purity has nothing to do with sex. That's, that's, I'll, I'll just state it that way. That's basically what they're trying to say. Their argument here, I don't quite understand exactly where they're going to go because I think, I don't know exactly what their point is. Hey, you can't use the word purity to say that, hey, you must be pure, therefore you can't have sex outside of marriage. Because the word purity doesn't refer to sexual uh, immorality or sexual action outside of uh, your marital relationship. Purity has nothing to do with sex. Okay, so are you saying that if I go from Matthew to Revelation, that I will never come across anything that would seem to indicate that sex outside of marriage is sinful. Like I like, I I'm having a hard time understanding how they would, how they would come to that conclusion. Like this is just, okay, this one, this one is confusing to me. So let's, let's read this again. So so they, they go to the old Testament. They say purity, basically now I'll just help. I'll help clarify what they're trying to say. The first paragraph that what they want us to understand is if you take the word purity and look in the Old Testament, it's going to be connected to the Levitical laws, right? You can't touch a dead body. You can't, uh, you can't have idols. Uh, if a woman's on our menstrual cycle, she's, you know, basically all the things that would refer to being, I think the King James uses the word unclean. You're ceremonially unclean. You would have to go through this process so that you could be clean again and then be put a quote back into a, a state of ceremonial cleanliness. So they, 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 that's their first kind of paragraph. Okay, I think that there's, it's clear in the Old Testament, purity was associated with lots of things. I got no problem with that. But then they jump to the New Testament and say, hey, purity has nothing to do with sex. So therefore you can have sex outside of marriage and still be pure. But the issue is, does the New Testament condemn sex outside of marriage. Does it? Well, I'm just going to, I'm going to play a little game here. I'm going to put a I'm going to put a little game here. I'm just going to, because this person took the time to email me this and this, and this, and whoever they're quoting this and this article that they're quoting from, they took the time to write the article. I'm just curious how much research, I'm just curious how much research they did. So I'm going to put the Bible condemns sex uh, before marriage. All right. Um, Now, okay, well, this is interesting. There's uh, 
There's a lot. There's some articles that tries to, I guess, challenge this. All right. But here we go. Um, I'm looking here. I'm looking here if they give us uh, this one doesn't give us a lot of information. I thought they were going to try to argue against it, but they don't actually try to argue against it. Um, let's see here. I'm gonna, I'm just going to read from one. Just I, I just did a Google search and I just wanted to pull these up randomly because I just want you to see that this is someone who's making an argument. And I and I guess I didn't even bother even just to do a little bit of, of searching. But here, just I'll give you an example of one article. In the Bible, sexual sins are clearly condemned. Adultery, consexual sex between a married person and someone other than their spouse, fornication, sexual immorality in general are specified. Sex before marriage or premarital sex is not addressed in that exact term, but it does fall within the scope of sexual immorality. All right, so here, here becomes the issue. And, and, I, and I, I remember teenagers making some of these arguments a long time ago. So this is not something new. Look, any, anyone who's, look, there's one, here's one thing that we know. All right, well, let's just get this out of the way. Let's be very blunt today. Human beings are sexual creatures, right? Human beings are biologically designed. They're, they're made up to have sexual desires. That is natural. It is what we are, we are designed to participate in it in some way, shape or form. That's, that's just the reality. I mean, we can't deny that the desire is there. It's there. So because it's there, because the desire can be, depending on the individual, so strong that obviously if you pick up a, a religious text and you're like, wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute, that seems to go against what I want. There's always a tendency to go, well, well, I mean, what if I do this? What if I do this? What if I do that? We all do that in some way, shape or form, right? And the Bible seems to go so far that if I even look at a woman with lust, I'm already, I'm already guilty of at least adultery which would assume that I could be guilty of, well, sexual immorality of all kinds by looking at someone and having lust. So the Bible clearly seems to have prohibitions against it, but because it doesn't necessarily say the words premarital sex, many try to say, well, see, 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 as long as I don't get married, right? As long as I don't get married, and as long as I don't have sex with someone else's spouse, then I can have all the sex I want. They're, they're, or, or if we're in a if we love one another, then I've heard all of the justifications because obviously we try to justify it. But let's see what they say here from the scriptures. The Bible teaches that sex before marriage is immoral in a couple of different passages. Now, remember, they're arguing in the article that no, 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 Christians just made this up because the word purity. Well, let's not focus on the word purity. Let's look at a couple of these scriptures. One is 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. All right, I'm going to read it from the ESV. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 2. But because of the temptation to sexual immorality, each man should have his own wife and each woman her own husband. Now, this goes back to 1 Corinthians 7, which they referenced earlier in the article. And guess what they did? They ignored, they ignored the actual context of 1 Corinthians 7. If they were to look at the actual context of the chapter, they, they wouldn't be making this point now in what, point number six of Bible verses that are supposedly made up. Because 1 Corinthians 7, it's clear. Because of the danger of sexual immorality, get married. Well, what sexual immorality are they referring to? The sexual immorality that would occur before you get married, which would be what? Premarital sex. Okay, so... Like, I think that's pretty clear, all right? It says, uh, one is 1 Corinthians 7, 2, which says, but since, but since sexual immorality is occurring, each man should have sexual relations with his own wife and each woman with her own husband. In this verse, marriage is presented as the cure for sexual immorality. Sexual union within marriage, which is commended, is set against immorality, which is to be avoided. Thus, any sex outside of marriage is considered immoral. This would have to include premarital sex. That, that's just a lot. I mean, I don't know why the article's like, look, look, the New Testament doesn't use the word pure. So therefore, it, you can have all the premarital sex you want. It's just a bizarre argument. Another verse that presents sex before marriage is immoral is Hebrew, Hebrews 13, 4. Marriage should be honored by all and the marriage bed kept pure for God will judge the adulterer and all the sexually immoral. 
Here we have both adultery and fornication contrasted with what happens in the marriage bed. Marriage and sexual intercourse within marriage is honorable. All other types of sexual activity are condemned as immoral and brings God's judgment. Based on these passages, a biblical definition of sexual immorality would have to include sex before marriage. That means that the, that all the Bible verses condemning sexual immorality is, in general, also condemns sex before marriage. This includes Acts 15.20, 1 Corinthians 5, 1, 6, 13. I mean, they, they list all of them, all right? So um, I, I, don't, I don't know how you can, I don't know how you could literally in good conscience write an article saying, hey, hey, purity doesn't mean virginity because the Bible doesn't actually condemn premarital sex. So you can have all the sex you want before marriage because Christians made that up. I, 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 I am, I'm often baffled I, I've got to be honest here. I'm often baffled by everyone's response to sex. You, you, just stay with me. I know we're at 21 minutes. Just stay with me. And, and this is really today's focus. This is really today's focus. I want you to consider the bizarre way that, that the world, that everyone in the church, outside the church, deals with sex. It just, it literally confuses me so much. Let me give you an example. All right. So in the world, right? In the world, they, they have, they, they have this weird attempt. I'll, I'll just, I'll just use the home. I'm not saying everyone in the world does this, but I'll just use the example of say the LGBTQ community and the homosexual community. It, it blows my mind how they, and most of them have walked away from the church, walked away from Christianity, they 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 are living in a a relationship, a homosexual relationship, same sex relationship. But for some weird reason, they still want to try to write articles, make documentaries, and argue the Bible does not condemn homosexuality. That's a lie. It never condemns homosexuality. And you're like, what are you talking about? Well, I mean, anyone who reads the Bible, you would have to say, well, wait a minute. First of all, you got to be married. I mean, because any sex outside of marriage would be considered sinful. Number two, there's no way you could say the Bible would justify marriage between two men or two women because the Bible clearly says marriage is between a man and a woman. So in other words, you would, so I don't know why you would even try to go to the Bible and make this argument, but there's those in the world who want to just say, no, 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 the Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. The Bible doesn't condemn homosexuality. And it's so bizarre because many of those same people won't argue, uh, oh, by the way, not only does the Bible not condemn homosexuality, it doesn't condemn adultery. It doesn't, well, wait a minute. If you're going to throw out homosexuality, throw out all the other prohibitions against sex. But it's like, no, no, I just want homosexuality not to be considered sinful. Why? Why are you so worried about trying to change the biblical teaching so that you can then walk around saying homosexuality is justified. Get everyone off the hook. Get adulterers off the hook, fornicators off. Let's get everyone who's committed sexual sin off. No, it's just, we're going to, we're just going to worry about same-sex marriage. And it's like, what is your preoccupation with trying to change the Bible to justify it? It just, it makes no sense to me. Why would you even be worried about it? You walked away from Christianity. Why do you care what it says? So I find that fascinating. In the church, I find it utterly fascinating that we act, that Christians act like any sexual sin at all, any sexual sin, any deviation from the biblical standard is like the greatest sin of all sins. It is scandalous. It is it is bad. It's to be whispered. And then it's to be brought. It, on one hand, it's to be whispered because it's so bad and so scandalous. On the other hand, we got to make sure that we blast people all over the all over the internet who's involved in any kind of s sexual sin of any kind. It's like we've treated it like I don't know, like it's the greatest sin in the history of the world. And it's so weird. It's like you can commit 30 sins and you're good to go. You deviate anyway in a sexual way and it's like ooh it's, it's so bad. That's the end of you. You've got, and it's like, well, what about all these other sins? Why does sexual sin get treated in such a way that, that it's like the world wants to somehow justify their sexual sin by changing the Bible. And then many Christians 
wants to use the pro- the prohibition against sexual sin as an opportunity to utterly destroy anyone who has any deviation and treats their sexual sin as the worst sin of all time while ignoring other sins. How come gluttony doesn't get the same? Uh, how come gossip doesn't get the same? Boom. Slander, bitterness, unforgiveness, anger, pride. I mean, like, why doesn't these other things get the same? Like, oh, can you believe what they've done? But so it's weird. Like on one hand, you got people wanting to make the Bible justify their sin. On the other hand, it's like, this is the only sin that matters. Where's a more biblical view of it? Well, here's what I can say. The Bible gives a morality when it comes to sex. And, and, And just listen to me. It's, it's, and I know some are going to disagree with this, but this goes right back to my teaching of law and gospel. The Bible offers a morality about sexuality that somewhere, somehow, everyone's going to be guilty in some way, shape, or form. Period. Right? Because not only do you have the physical act, you have the internal. Look with lust, you're guilty. I can't, I will never try to speak for women, never been inside of a woman's body. Obviously, I have, I'm a man, I'm, I, in my, I'm in, in my own body, so I can't see it from a woman's perspective. I can't see what that looks like or that feels like, but I can speak for a man, that, and I think most men would acknowledge this, that many men struggle with lust constantly, constantly, in some way, shape, or form, all right? Um, what, what is it? Let me see. I know we're almost at 30 minutes. Uh, let's see here. Um, hang on. I'm looking something up. I don't know if this is, I'm going to just look it up. All right, here we go here. Um Okay, so they did some research. Okay, here, here's, this is the, the most, the latest research I can find. All right, so they did a study, right? And, uh, and they asked, basically, they did a study trying to figure out how often men think about sex and how often women think about sex. Men think about sex 19 times a day and supposedly women 10 times a day. Now, obviously, there would be variations um, about that. Um, they they did. Uh, okay, well, then they go. They do. They they updated the study. Seems around uh, uh, around about that time. There's different. It looks like there's a little variations here or there, and of course, it's going to vary by person to person. Now, obviously, just thinking about sex does not necessarily you've crossed some line. But the point is, if you're thinking about sex 19 times a day, 20 times a day, 30 times a day, five times a day, eight times a day, if it's a reoccurring thing, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, I mean, just every day of the week year after year after year after year, you understand that if you take the biblical seeming standard of sexuality, you're going to be guilty in some way, shape, or form. You're going to be guilty. Now, what we do is we say, okay, well, well, you're guilty, but we're not going to treat that guilt the way we treat this guilt. I understand that there's differences and because of the people who are hurt and the different things. It's just odd that the way the church elevates this sin, and it's like, Without and people are picking up rocks ready to throw it. I'm like, but from a biblical standard, you're you're guilty in maybe a different way, but you're just as guilty. I, again, I can't speak for women, okay, but for men, many of them, when you talk about that many times a day, some of that those thoughts definitely cross the line. Definitely cross the line. And what does this demonstrate? That the biblical morality that is put forth, constant. Listen. The biblical morality, which is God's law, always reveals our sin and always condemns if we are open and honest to it. I'm not saying it, I'm not saying that this justifies our sin, 
I'm saying that we have to be more open and honest with the fact of it because the law condemns our only hope is the imputed righteousness of Christ. I'm not saying this justifies anything. I just think we need a, it's like on one hand, you got like this article saying, hey, 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 premarital sex is not wrong because the word pure doesn't have anything to do with virginity. What are you talking about? There's all kinds of other scriptures dealing with the issue. What would that, That's just a foolish argument. Why would you even try to somehow justify premarital sex if you've already left Christianity? But it's some weird, like, I'm going to go back and I'm going to prove to all the Christians that homosexuality is okay, adultery is okay, premarital sex is okay. It's like, what, what, is, what is your issue? The Bible seems clear. On the other hand, Christians run around like, okay, okay, okay. Anybody who committed a sexual sin, we need to have them crucified. And then we need to burn the body. And then we need to never mention the name again. And it's like, I, come on, people. If we look at the biblical standard, we're all guilty in some way, shape, or form. Constantly. Some more than others. Now, yeah, I am not saying that justifies anything. People sometimes seems to... They miss un- when you deal with law and gospel. Some people get really nervous when you say the law condemns. They're like, no, 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 no. We can obey it. No, we can't obey the law perfectly. We're all going to fall short. We're all going to be guilty either in thought, word, deed, or desire. Somewhere in that spectrum between thought, word, deed, and desire, we do not conform perfectly to the standard of God, which is holiness. Therefore, we are in a perpetual state of sin in some way, shape, or form. I'm not saying that excuses the sin. What I'm saying is that is where we have to be more honest with ourselves. You can see someone committed one sin and you're like, oh man, that's bad. Yeah, and how many sins have you committed? Theirs became public. Theirs became scandal. What about yours that's in private? It's just, the article just brings up this weird, to me, un, it's just a weird way that everyone handles the subject, right? On one hand, the world wants to say, the Bible doesn't condemn it. Well, why, are, why are you even trying to do Clearly the Bible condemns it. And on the other hand, Christians are like, it's right, it condemns it. And then they want to condemn everyone. And then they want to destroy people who who make any violation within the area of sex. Almost like it's the unforgivable sin. And there can be no hope, no reconciliation, no restoration, and no nothing. And it's so weird. It's like, because, and and this is the way, and we do, and I, you have to acknowledge this. This is the way we view it. You look, you can commit all the sexual sin you want in your mind and in your heart. Just don't let it go over to any physical action because the minute it becomes physical action, now it's really wrong. As long as you can keep it in your mind and in your heart, the reality is nobody cares. But the minute it becomes public, then all of a sudden we care. Well, if we could all just admit, man, we all struggle in this area. I like, I can't speak again. I can't speak for women. But I mean, even that article, the latest research has women, it's 19 times a day for men, 10 times a day for women. I don't think if I, I don't know if I read that because I was trying to look at the rest of the article. So that would mean that both men and women are guilty. And it's so how pharisaical we can act in regards to the subject. So I don't know. You, you can tell me what you think of it. It's just a weird, the article, I had, I had to try to deviate because the article is so weird. Hey, the word purity has nothing to do with virginity. So therefore premarital sex is okay. What are you talking about? Like what, what your argument is based off the word purity. <laughs> you do realize the Bible can talk about a subject using different words, right? <laughs> okay, right. <laughs> The most bizarre thing I've ever seen. And that, like, what are you talking about? Like, literally, I don't know what they're talking about. Um, that is bizarre. Like, they've made some good points, maybe about Jeremiah 17, 9, and the, the translation found in the Septuagint. Okay, I'm glad I read the article. Maybe they make some good points about discipline and how the word rod is used throughout the Bible. Okay, maybe you make some valid points. But then there's other situations you're like, what are you talking about? First Corinthians seven, nine burning there refers to grief and not to sexual, sexual desire when the whole chapter is about sex. And then you later you come down 
and say purity does not equal virginity. Therefore, you can commit premarital sex. The Bible doesn't condemn it. But yet, you didn't even read the actual chapter of 1 Corinthians 7, which would have given you the answer to the burning and given you the answer to this. I, it's just, I, I, so, man, I, it, I find it funny when people write articles where they come across so arrogant, claiming that Christians have made everything up and all they've demonstrated is their own lack of comprehending what the Bible actually says. But instead of being dismissive to them, I think it's a warning to all of us that we come up to, we as Christians, we can hold ideas and we can hold conclusions that many times are just as contradictory to the Bible as this article is. So before we say, what are you doing? We probably should look to ourselves. And I think maybe we ha need to have a more honest view of sex because we're sexual creatures and people think about it frequently and many of those thoughts cross a line. And if it does, then we're guilty. And guess what? Don't be shocked by that. I, I Sometimes Christians are like, Christians are never guilty of any sexual sin. What are you talking about? Sexual sin has been a part of Christianity since its inception, all right? Because we're sexual beings, right, who desire it. So guess what? If we, we need the imputed righteousness of Christ. Doesn't excuse it. But I'm saying we we can try to we can try to fight against that. But what about all the? Uh, it's just weird. This one gets elevated while all the other sins are good to go. All the other sins, it's just doesn't. Oh, you're, you're slothful. That's okay. Glutton. That's okay. Prideful. That's okay. Uh, you are lack of mercy or compassion. That's okay. You don't love people the way you're supposed to. That's okay. You gossip. You slander. That's okay. You're not submissive to where. No, that's okay. You have no respect for authority. That's okay. It's like, and you say, well, we don't say it's okay. Yeah, but trust me, how do you, how do, how do those sins get treated versus how other sins get treated? Don't tell me there's not a difference. Don't tell me there's not a difference. I've been in Christianity too long to know there is a drastically, a, a, trust me, there is a difference. Everyone loses their minds over those sins and not, and so I, it's the world confuses me. The church confuses me. We just need a more biblical approach to it. All right. There you go. You can email me. News, if at yahoo.com. Yes, I know I went long again today. I know, I know, I know, I know. That's okay. That's okay. It's the last day of the year. We'll, we'll, we'll reset as soon as, as probably... I don't know what we'll do for uh, today's focus tomorrow. Um, I have church, Sunday school, Sunday morning, Sunday night. But Monday will be in 2023. And what we'll try to do is reset the today's focus to try to fit back to its original purpose a little bit better. But when I when I thought, when I, thought I was going to do this article for the today's focus, I just didn't realize. Um, well, once again, I... I thought I could handle it in a certain way, and these some of these require a little bit more time. You get into some, some of these are very uh, the the thing I love about the article is it gets to, into some really touchy, sensitive subjects. I mean, the, some of this makes us uncomfortable, but we have to deal with it. it makes me uncomfortable, right? It makes us all uncomfortable to deal with some of these issues. They're very sensitive. We're dealing with discipline of children. That's a sensitive subject. We're dealing with the sexual issues. That's a sensitive subject. And I, I, I just think that we all can have to, I just think Christians need to be better at just being honest with our, with our issues. And I just don't know why it, that it's just so weird. You can commit 50 other sins and it's like good to go. But this one, it's like, oh my goodness, it's the end of the world. It's like, why does, well, I just don't understand why other sins don't bother us, but anything related to this subject, we're ready to throw ourselves off a cliff. I just don't, I've watched the utter shame and destruction, I feel, of people's lives because they found themselves in this sin and then that's it. They don't, like, it's like so much shame, so much guilt, and they in many ways walk away from Christianity. And in many cases, Christians are the ones pushing them out the door. I, I don't know. You, you, you can tell me what you think. Newsif at yahoo.com. Newsif at yahoo.com. That's newsif at yahoo.com. This has been 
the last Today's Focus podcast episode for 2022. Hopefully 2023, we can make this better and it will accomplish its ultimate goal, which is to give you one thing to focus on throughout your day because you live in a world of distractions.